Nice to see you again. Welcome. So, what I wanted to talk about this evening, this evening where I am, is that the state of uh, enlightened awareness, the state of awakening, the state of enlightenment, is not merely a state of consciousness. <clears throat> a lot of people, when they think about enlightenment, they think it's the experience of a certain feeling a certain expanded state of consciousness, a realization of emptiness or fullness or realization of bliss or the recognition of oneness, an experience of happiness or peace or exhilaration or clarity. But often when we think about enlightenment, we think of it as a state of consciousness. And the point I want to make, and it's a simple point, but it's a profound point and an important point is that, and I think it's the most more important, most important point to understand is that enlightenment is not merely a state of consciousness, but in the relative world of time and space where the body, mind, and personality abide and operate, enlightenment or lack thereof, <laughs> enlightenment or unenlightenment, is a position that we take in relationship to life consciously or unconsciously in any given moment. So this is what makes the state of enlightenment so interesting because if it's not merely a state but it's also a position that we take in relationship to body, mind, personality, time, and space, then we can ask ourselves an interesting question, which is, what kind of relationship am I taking or assuming consciously or unconsciously to the body, what is, the, is the body, mind, and personality taking in relationship to the context of body, space, time, and world? And does that position I'm taking consciously or unconsciously reflect my attainment of enlightened awareness or my lack of attainment thereof. Mm -hmm. In other words, if <laughs> in other words, if you were looking through a camera at yourself, would you say, wow, this is an awakened enlightened person, or would you say this was not an awakened or enlightened person? Because with the with our pursuit with our pursuit of enlightenment, our, our pursuit of enlightened awareness, historically there have been profound and incredibly inspiring exemplars of this attainment. People like the Buddha, Ramana Maharshi, Sri Ramakrishna, and many others. And so the point here is that for most of us, or for all of us, enlightenment. We think about it, it's not merely a state of consciousness, but it's a. It looks like something. <laughs> In the context of our that the awakened human, the awakened human, our awakened humanity looks like something. It looks enlightenment, the state of enlightenment. We all believe, for good reason, the state of enlightenment looks like something. It looks like the time of the Buddha. It looks like Sri Ramana Maharshi. It looks like Sri Ramakrishna. Krishna. It looks like other enlightened saints and sages and realizers, men and, both women, men and women. It looks, enlightenment looks like something, feels like something. And it looks like something because the individual who has attained the state of enlightened awareness assumes a certain, or a certain position or positions in relationship to their experience. It looks like something extraordinary, profound, miraculous, and meaningful. It looks different, the positions that the enlightened ones take in relationship to body, mind, personality, time, space, and world look different than the ordinary person. The enlightened person's relationship to life looks different, feels different, is different. And this is the question I wanted everybody to kind of reflect on tonight or today. 
I want everybody to reflect on your own life and does your life look like an enlightened life? Does it look like someone who had awakened and was sustaining this awakened consciousness? Does the life that you're living right now look like that? Or does it need a little work, a little uh, a few, a few a few adjustments here and there? Tighten up the <laughs> tighten up the edges. So this way of looking at enlightenment as a position that's taken consciously or unconsciously, spontaneously or deliberately, can help us to look at our own pursuit of liberation in a very different way, in a way that's very Makes it makes it much more tangible. Makes it less purely metaphysical. Makes it something we can relate to with our minds and with our emotions and with our deep considerations. Some people think I'm enlightened. <laughs> Some people think so, and they think so because I apparently have demonstrated or continue to demonstrate for some people what enlightenment looks like. That's why they follow me. That's why they pay attention to me. That's why they listen to me. That's why they want to spend time with me. And I'm aware that ever since I met my guru in 1986, and he told me that he wanted me to teach, he told me, he said, Andrew, I want you to accept responsibility for this work. He said, you, you've understood everything I have to teach, and I want you to accept responsibility for this work. At the time, I didn't know what that meant, but I soon found out. But in any case, ever since that time, I felt an enormous sense of responsibility to, in my own imperfect way, to uphold or to somehow be a be an exemplar in, in the context of my own inherent imperfection of what enlightenment looks like. And that's interesting. <laughs> It's interesting and it's challenging and it's true. I'm being very honest with all of you. So enlightenment for me is not only an, an inner attainment as a higher state of consciousness, which of course it is. It's not just a, a feeling of being or the exhilaration of inner freedom. But it's also a grave and great, profound, responsibility I feel very I feel responsible to be an exemplar in the context of the imperfection of my humanity and that helps me it helps me to know that I'm that I am an exemplar that I've chosen that when I surrender to the guru's wishes that I accepted responsibility for what he was asking me to do. And the accept, in, inherent in accepting that responsibility was an obligation. And I think that not enough of us, not enough of us who are seeking for our liberation, see, see liberation as, a, as, not, as not just a Christmas present from God, <laughs> as a happy feeling or happy state or some kind of big spiritual prize at the end of the rainbow. But as a grave and grave and sober obligation, not only to oneself but also to all of life, it means that I, if I'm going to be an exemplar, it means I have to be a re representative in the context of my own imperfect and evolving humanity to represent the highest principle in the universe, which is the God principle or the absolute principle, or the spiritual principle, which is the foundation of everything that exists. So often when we're, when we're thinking about our own seeking for liberation, we're often thinking about how we feel and what we think and what's easy for us and what's difficult for us. 
etc. But the picture changes when you're not thinking about this in terms of how you feel about it, but you start thinking about spiritual transformation it becomes an obligation. It becomes an obligation to, to stand for a higher possibility, a higher truth, a higher principle in this crazy, chaotic, confused world where so many people are lost, confused, frightened, and angry. So this is something that I've been trying to convey to people for many years, and it's, it's difficult to share this perspective because if you if you can get the point, I'm of course you get the point of what I'm trying to say it can save you a lot of time. But yes, enlightenment is a state of consciousness; it's a higher state of consciousness. It's a vibration that comes from the center of the universe, and when you awaken to it, it'll set you free. That's all true, but it's also a position that we take in relationship to the challenge of being human in this chaotic and evolving world. And so I wanted to, when I was speaking about this tonight, I wanted to ask all of you to ask yourselves in the context of reflection, what kind of position are you taking in relationship to the world you're living in, in relationship to the totality of your own karmic predicament? Do you, do you feel that you're an exemplar? Do you hold yourself to a higher standard? Are you aware that people are watching you? <laughs> Do you feel you're worthy? Do you feel you need to be worthy, that you have no choice, that you have an obligation to be worthy? If you do, then it'll save you a lot of time and a lot of money in psychotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> because if you realize it's an obligation how your ego feels about it doesn't matter doesn't really matter anymore how your ego feels doesn't make any difference anymore because now you have an obligation to be a spiritual warrior to act like a spiritual warrior to behave like a spiritual warrior to be true, to be noble, to be dignified, to, to be a reflection of the highest principle in the universe, which is the God principle. In all your, our, my imperfection, our shared imperfection. Because the inherent in being human is imperfection because we're all works in progress. So there is no human being that is fully evolved, that has attained some final resting place. Everybody's a work in progress. Even Lord Buddha was a work in progress. Ramana Maharshi was a work in progress. Well, works in progress. You can, we can all be a work in progress and still have realized that which is eternal. Extraordinary, profound, and miraculous, but on the level of our shared humanity, the level of being human, we're all works in progress, which means we're all inherently imperfect. Because perfection is unattainable. Perfection is attainable as a state of consciousness, but not as a state of our persona. Our persona is a work, always a work in progress and inherently imperfect. So our inherent imperfection, because we're all works in progress, challenges us if we if we choose to accept the role of the exemplar or the enlightened one in this crazy, chaotic, and confused world. Because now we have to be ready to show up with strength and dignity and clarity and self-respect so we can be a fit vehicle for this, for the miracle of higher consciousness, the miracle of enlightened awareness, which is real, which, which exists. And that's a challenge. The experience of bliss consciousness, it's easy, it's not a challenge. To experience bliss consciousness takes no effort. But to, enhold, but to uphold on a human level the implications of bliss consciousness requires a deep commitment and enormous self-respect, enormous surrender to a higher principle, a submission of one's will to a higher will. That's what, that's what makes the enlightened person so compelling, so attractive, so 
radiant is because they have submitted their own personal will to a higher will. When you submit your own personal will to a higher will, then that higher will begins to be reflected through the through the through the imperfection of your body, mind, and personality. Begins to reflect the perfection of this higher will. That's what makes enlightened men and women so attractive, because they are not merely human beings anymore. Human beings who have access to this higher state, and a higher state is a reflection of the will of the absolute. Call it the will of God, if you like. The will of this higher spiritual principle. So this 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 demands a lot from us. It's asking we have to. It asks a lot from us. We have to be ready, <laughs> and most of us don't feel that we're quite ready yet to be so responsible and to be so obligated because we know we're not perfect. And a lot of seekers are waiting, to, waiting to reach perfection before they can say yes to God, which is ridiculous because no one's ever you know, that say to put. But you're never going to reach that state of perfection. You can get close to it by saying yes anyway. But if you say yes, you have to be willing to back it up, which is to make enormous effort, to make enormous sacrifices, to surrender unconditionally, and to make absolute commitment to the will of the absolute as you experience it and as you understand it. And that doesn't leave much wiggle room for a weak ego. And because there's not much wiggle room for a weak ego, that if we accept that there's not much wiggle room and we embrace that truth, that can become a source of our own strength and spiritual will. The truth can become so powerful and so compelling and so commanding, so meaningful for other people. If another person realizes, if another person gets to know an enlightened person and they realize through observation over a long period of time that such a person is actually holding this higher principle, this God principle, this absolute principle, they're holding it, they are a caretaker. They are a worthy caretaker of this higher principle. This awakens kind of uh, respect, respect for spirit respect for the guru principle, respect for the spiritual principle. And that humbles the ego very quickly. The ego gets humbled and then we find and that humility, dignity, self-respect, and a natural and spontaneous desire to be worthy of this higher principle. Because a, a, a true seeker wants to be worthy. I want to be worthy. Oh Lord, I want to be worthy of thee. Well, the desire to want to be worthy is a very spiritually noble place to be. The, the, the desire to want to be worthy of being a caretaker, being a exemplar, being a being so serious and being so committed in public. And the more people recognize this, the more people recognize that the spiritual principle actually exists. And they know it exists because you are proving that it does, in spite of all your imperfection. You're proving it, you're demonstrating it, you are transmitting it through the choices that you make and the actions that you take with the body, mind, personality in the context of time, space, and world. The choices you make and the actions you take and the, the the relationship you have to the world around you, the relationship you have to your mind, to your body, to your emotions, your inner experience, the relationship to other people, to your family, to your children, to your parents, to your friends, to your spiritual friends, the world around you. What kind of relationship do you have to the world around you? Does the relationship you have to the world around you express or demonstrate that you are enlightened or awakened? Because if you are truly enlightened, truly awakened, 
your life is going to look different. It's not going to look like an, like an ordinary life, whatever an ordinary life is. <laughs> I don't know what an ordinary life looks like. I guess an ordinary life does not look extraordinary. <laughs> but whatever it looks like. So, so if, an, if an enlightened life looks like something, and you want to ask yourself, what does it look like? What do you think it looks like? And whatever you come up with, whatever definition you come up with that, that satisfies your criteria for enlightenment, then ask yourself if your own life looks like that. And if it does, muscle talk, congratulations. And if it doesn't, you have to ask yourself, well, why doesn't it look like it? What, 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 what's, it, what's in the way? What is preventing my life from looking exactly the way I imagine or believe or convince an enlightened life looks like? What choices and action, what choices am I making? What actions am I taking that are taking me in the direction of what I believe an enlightened looks like? And what actions am I taking, choices am I making that's take, taking me in the opposite direction? And in this kind of introspective analysis, the self-reflective analysis. You want to be brutally, ruthlessly honest with yourself. This is a conversation you can have with yourself. You don't have to have this conversation with anybody else. So within the privacy of your own mind and your own soul and your own consciousness, you can be honest. There's nobody, to, there's nobody, nobody, there, nobody else there to shame you or to tell you what you should do because it's your life, it's your choice, it's your mind, it's your soul. But have the courage and have the strength to kind of be brutally honest with yourself. Knowing that how many, no matter what the picture looks like, it's going to be imperfect. Why? Because you're human. So it's okay to be imperfect. <laughs> it's okay to be imperfect. But it's not okay to not care deeply about these deeper, higher matters, if you believe these deeper, higher matters are the most important thing that there is. So how much you care and how much I care can clearly be seen in our life, my life and your life, in the way we're choosing to live the lives we're leading right now. So as I've been saying, have the courage to be brutally honest with yourself and if you have the courage to, to be brutally honest, then you can have, also have the courage to change what needs to be changed and adjust what needs to be adjusted. Have the courage to change, have the courage to be true to your own self. Have the courage to be true to your own insights about what all this looks like, what it should look like, what you believe it should look like, what you believe it does look like. And you be your own guru then, in this kind of, kind of context. But do it for real. Pretend it like, act, act as if it really matters, if it was the most important thing in the world. <laughs> in the life that I live, in the way that I live it, it actually is the most important thing in the world. So anybody can go through this, the, the practice of this kind of introspection. And it's powerful and it's profound. And you, you can put your own, you, you can find out what you really think about enlightenment, about liberation, and about yourself. You get to find out what you think, and then you get to make adjustments. Because the way a lot of people think about it is that enlightenment is some mysterious, miraculous state of consciousness that just is going to happen one day. <laughs> it's just going to happen one day if you're lucky going to happen one day and then it's all going to be easy from that point on which may or may not be true it's probably not true could be true <laughs> but just what I'm responding to here is that don't put it off don't have, have the courage not to put any of this off to the future have the courage and the spiritual will to put yourself on the spot now And see all the places where you feel you're falling short in relationship to your own ideas of how this is supposed to look. 
and then make the adjustments sometime around now. But whatever you do, don't wait. Don't wait, don't hesitate. So this is kind of what I wanted to speak about. For enlightenment, we're always looking outside of ourselves. But as we practice, as we all, as we practice into introspection, contemplation, contemplate the nature of consciousness, if we contemplate the nature of our own consciousness. Also contemplate the nature of our own integrity our lack of a relationship to us living up, living up to our own highest aspirations. If you can do this, you won't have to wait for another lifetime for all this to happen. It can all happen in this life. To put this in another, another way, enlightenment is a confrontation with the absolute. It's a confrontation between the relative reality and absolute reality. It's a confrontation. Your, your human persona, personality is, re, is a reflection of your relative self. Relative self lives in a relative context, in, in, the, in the context of relative reality. When you awaken to enlightened awareness, it's awakening to a non-relative or absolute context and absolute self. So enlightenment, which happens to human beings, like you and me, gives rise to this confrontation between relative reality and, com- and absolute reality. There's a confrontation there. Or what you could say, there's a creative friction. And the more profound the creative friction there is between relative and absolute reality, the more profound will be the expression of the, the magnificent coherence between these two. And when you reach a state of profound coherence between relative reality and absolute reality, or your relative self and your absolute self, when you reach a state of coherence between those two, your body, mind, and personality will become a the expression of what a fit vehicle looks like for this absolute dimension of reality. And then, and then, and then, it, then it will suddenly feel like your relative persona, your relative personality, your relative body, mind, and personality. It's actually the perfect the perfect vehicle for this absolute principle. Suddenly you realize that your persona, your body, mind, and personality, you suddenly realize is actually the most perfect and fit vehicle for this absolute truth. This is this is coherence between relative and absolute, and it's also the moment of liberation because that's when you stop to you begin to accept yourself, your small self, your body, mind, personality, your persona, unconditionally, radically, and absolutely. Because you realize in, in, in all the inherent imperfection of your persona, little did you know that it was actually a perfect vehicle for the God principle. <laughs> what do you think about that? And if you're lucky enough to have such a realization, if you're lucky enough to have such a realization, you will be blessed. You will be blessed and you'll know you're blessed. You'll feel it. You'll feel the blessings of uh, God and gurus, of all the realizers and all the lineages throughout history. You'll feel their blessings upon you. And then suddenly being an imperfect human being is not a problem to be overcome. It becomes the very vehicle through which the God principle enters into the earth plane. So it becomes a gift. So then being you, the body, mind, and personality then becomes a gift. Not a problem to be overcome, but a gift. Transformation. 
How's that for a transformation? Could there be a bigger transformation than that? I don't think so. And a lot of these kinds of changes that I'm speaking about can happen very quickly, very easily, very quietly within the context of your own awakened mind and consciousness. If you don't resist the absolute nature of what I'm speaking about, if you cease to resist the absolute nature of this confrontation between relative and absolute dimensions of reality and self, you stop resisting this kind of flip or deep, deeper, higher alignment can happen very easily, very naturally and very quickly in ways that are hard for the mind to even imagine or believe. So the unenlightened mind makes all this into a great big ordeal, a big crisis, and a big difficulty. It really doesn't need to be difficult. It doesn't need to be such an ordeal if we stop resisting our own spiritual aspiration. It's only the ego that makes us into an ordeal. Your ego, my ego, the ego makes all this into a great ordeal. When the awakening process begins to happen by itself, the ego becomes overshadowed by the true self, the authentic self. When that happens, it all becomes very easy, natural, effortless, and spontaneous. So if you're lucky, you won't fall into the trap of making this into some terrible ordeal, agonizing ordeal that will take you life, years and lifetimes. It doesn't have to be that way. Or should I say, how many lifetimes does it take? <laughs> Any one of us to realize it doesn't have to take lifetimes. I don't know. One of the things that never ceases to amaze me is the subtlety and profundity inherent in all of this. The subtlety, the, the profundity, the mysterious nature of the of consciousness and how it evolves. And the mystery of the, the apparent world context that's all occurring within. But as you all already know, when you come back home, everybody realizes that you've been there all you've been there all along. And everything else was just one big illusion. But since we know that already, we can save ourselves a lot of time and a lot of grief and a lot of suffering. So I'm almost finished. So what I've been advocating today is um, that there's there's two different ways to look at the our human experience, the human experience as our human experience. And one way to look at the human experience or, or our at our human experience is from the inside out, which is what spiritual seekers and meditators tend to do as we're looking. Our vantage point is from the subjective, to what appears to be the subject, the subjective center of our inner experience outward. We're looking out outwards upon the body and the mind and the world from the subjective inner center point or inner vantage point. 
looking out upon the body, the mind, the persona, the world of time and space, the whole universe. We're looking at from our subjective core, subjective inner center. And that's one way to look at our experience of reality. It's one perspective, and it's a valid perspective. But there's another way to look at our experience, which is equally important and equally valid, which is what I've been advocating in this talk this evening. And that's to make the effort to look at our the totality of our self in relationship to the life context that we're that we're operating within from the outside in. What do you look like from the outside? It's still you looking at you. <laughs> it's still you looking at you, but now you you're you're not looking at you from the inside out. Now you're looking at you from you know you're looking at you from the outside in. And so when you when you look at you from the outside in, you get a very different perspective and vantage point on your on yourself, even though it's still yourself that's doing the looking. It's very interesting. And we want to we want to be get very good at looking at ourselves from the inside out. The meditator's vantage point or the compulsive thinker's vantage point. You want to learn how to look at yourself from the outside in. And the outside observer, the outside observer, which is, of course, always you, looking at yourself from the outside in the context of the world space that you find your body, mind, and personality is operating within. You want to observe what do I look like from the outside in. And, and to repeat what I said before, it's all you, so you, you don't have to worry about anybody judging you. This is all you looking at you. So it's all safe. You don't have to worry. But, but I'm just advocating this This outside-in vantage point is very new for most people. It's very different. And it can help, it can help you to see and understand yourself in many ways that the inside-out perspective can't, can't do. Because the inside out perspective is, is always too close to the experience, the feeling experience, or the emotional experience that you might be in the midst of. But from the outside in, there's, there's, you're not close to the emotional core at that point. You just you're an observer, of watching a movie, in which you happen to be the star of the movie, but you're not you're not in the body, mind, and personality at that point. Or at least it, it, it feels like you're not. Even if you always still are, but it, temporarily it feels like you're not. It feels, it feels at least it feels like you're looking at yourself from the outside. And the reason that we do this is to help give ourselves more perspectives, more vantage points, more ways to understand ourselves, to see ourselves, and to liberate ourselves. It's also a way to be your own teacher. to take responsibility for your development. Because as I, as I was saying when I was giving my talk, how do you look to you? And in this case, we want, we want, we want the observer not to be your cruel ego. We don't want the cruel ego to be the observer in this case. We want to be the observer to be your own best self, your own best frontal self. The best part of your per, of your personality and your positive ego, or even your awakening to the authentic self and the true self, should they be present? What do they observe when you're looking at your own self? How do you look to the best parts of your own self? It'll help you. It'll help you to be to become utterly responsible for your own self, utterly responsible for your own being to become a master of your own self. This is what awakens self-knowledge. And if you have deep and profound self-knowledge, self-knowledge that's deep and profound, it's not just superficial, psychological, but really deep and profound. Then, as I was explaining, your persona, your personality begins to carry or express gravitas. 
because because you're not playing games because you're really paying attention to who you are and why you are who you are and why you are the way you are. You're paying attention to it all and you're choosing. You realize at a certain point that in a most important way, you're making a choice to be the kind of person that you are because you're making you're paying so much attention to who you are and why you are the way you are, which means you know yourself, know thyself. You're someone who knows thyself. And it's such a person carries a lot of gravitas and dignity and self-respect. Other people will feel it. They'll realize this is not a superficial person. This person has depth because they have self-conscious awareness and they know who they are. And they seem to be expressing an undividedness or wholeness or inherent integrity of being in their self-nature which is very powerful. Most people are so fractured and divided against themselves, so traumatized, that they, their, their being does not express wholeness or integrity, but expresses a superficiality and division and unconsciousness. But when your frontal self and your frontal personality begins to express a wholeness and a seamlessness and a consistency and an integrity and a gravitas, this is very compelling. It becomes very attractive for other people. So you realize this person is trustworthy. They're sane. They have depth and self-knowledge, and they're not playing games. For them, life is not a joke or a game to be game to be played with. But it's an experience to be taken very seriously or absolutely seriously. And someone who takes themselves that seriously will be willing to take you seriously if you're willing to take yourself seriously. And then, then, then a possibility of human relationship, a deep relationship and relatedness becomes possible in a way that is mutually beneficial and mutually spiritually empowering. So there's, so there's two ways to look at reality, at the reality of our selves. We can look from the inside out which is what we do most of the time, and we can look from the outside in. Practice both. But in the context of the talk I'm giving tonight, I'm emphasizing the this learning how to look at the oneself from the outside in. And as I said, on a good day, you'll be looking at yourself from the outside in from the perspective of your positive ego, mental self. And on a better day, it'll be your true self that's looking from the outside in. And an even better day will be for your authentic self looking from the outside in. At you. So the which you am I talking about? I'm talking about your persona. The you you think you are when you look at yourself in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> Because if you're going to be, free, if, we're going to, if we're going to be free, if we're going to, if we're going to do this for real, and we're going to, we're going to win this challenge, you have to get to the point where you like what you see when you see yourself in the mirror, where you love that person in all his or her imperfection of showing up in the mirror. That where you love that person, and you love that person because they're you. Right, you realize that person has self-respect and integrity of the level of the soul and they're trustworthy and they mean well and they care they're living in relation to higher principles they care they really care which means you care so we've got to get to the point where you feel that way about you about your own self and you're looking from the outside and you say yes this is a good person this is a decent person. This is a person that means well, but they, they, there's a sincerity and a gravitas there that carries weight. Beautiful. You know, it's very interesting in life, in life when we when we do things, for example, if we 
let's say I decided I was going to study philosophy. So if I told you, if I told you that I've been formally, that I've been formally and informally studying philosophy for 20 years, formally and informally and seriously, you'd go, wow, that's a lot of, that's a lot of time. You must know a lot about philosophy. <laughs> or let's say, I used to want to be a jazz drummer. So let's say I told you I've been studying jazz drumming for formally and informally for 20 years. You go, wow, you must be pretty good. Or if I was a, a poet, and I've been studying and practicing writing poetry for 20 years, you go, wow, you must be quite good. How many books have you published? And on like that kind of thing. So, or if I was practicing law, let's say I've been trying practicing law for practicing, studying, practicing law for 20 years, you would have seen, well, you must know a lot about it. You must be quite a, you know, have a sophisticated understanding of law or it applies to anything that we do except it seems for some inexplicable reason the practice of consciousness the practice of you practicing the evolution of consciousness practicing enlightenment the practice that leads to the awakening to enlightened awareness so for some inexplicable reason it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense to me just as i says well how long have you been seeking for enlightenment practicing how long have you been meditating Seriously and for formally and informally. Seriously. Oh, 20 years? So, wow. <laughs> you must know a lot about enlightenment, but <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> you say, why not? I thought you'd been on for 20 years. So it's funny to me because in the way that we think about development, it seems in terms of our sh some kind of shared agreements at a cultural level, it seems understandable that you expect if someone does is, is practicing formally and informally any 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 kind of activity, any developmental activity, it's reasonable to expect a certain degree of progress and development and attainment after twenty years, thirty years, except for spiritual practice. <laughs> Which never made any sense to me. It ne never made any sense to me. How long have you been at this? Uh, how long have you been seriously meditating and seriously studying human higher development, studying consciousness, going to see different kinds of spiritual teachers, going on spiritual retreats, reading spiritual books, contemplating this non relative or absolute context for life, purpose, meaning, thinking deeply about life? How long have you been at it? 20 years? Wow, you must have really made a lot of progress. Can you teach me? Not really. I'm just a beginner. <laughs> How can you be a beginner after 20 years, man? So I'm just asking everybody, don't let yourself off the hook. And this is all in the same context of looking at yourself, having the courage to look at yourself from the outside in. Have the courage to look at yourself and the, re the reality of your imperfect self. Where all of ourselves are imperfect. Frontal self is imperfect. Have the courage to look at the reality of the frontal self, the, the inherent imperfections of the frontal self, from the outside in. Can I take this person seriously? Are they trustworthy? Do they mean what they say? Are they wasting their time? Are they wasting time in life? Are they not wasting time in taking life seriously, the gift of life seriously? as you look at your own self. Because remember folks, time is all we've got. That's about it. Time is the gift that we've been given and we don't know how much time we have. But expect more from yourself, from yourselves. As you look from the outside and expect more from yourself than anybody else expecting anything else from you, but expect more from yourself. Because you're serious. That's why you're doing it for yourself.
And in a sense, in relationship to the title of this talk, Realize and Respond, you can see that how you show up, how I show up, how you show up, how we show up, is our response to life. So how you show up right now, how I show up right now, is how I'm responding. How I show up and how you show up is how I is my response to life. Is the totality of my response to life is how I show up right now. And this means, in its formal context, like this 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 talk tonight is this is a formal context. Or if we make sure a coffee, that's an informal context. So the way I show up, consciously and unconsciously, is my response to life. So when I show up, do I show up as being conscious, caring, like I'm paying attention to the, to the bigger context in which everything is occurring? Or do I, look, do I look like I'm lost in my mind and lost in my ego's narrative and lost in my own myopic little world, barely aware of anybody else, else's needs or concerns, even the world around me? So how you show up, which is how where you're at, <laughs> is 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 how you respond. Is how we're all responding. We're always responding. We're always responding. We're always responding. This is one of the points I try and make clear in this teaching, that we're always responding, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. But we're always responding uh, in gross and subtle ways. And how we respond is always it shows is, is proof or evidence of where we're at, what we really think and what we really feel. So the way you sh the way we show up, you and I show up, is our response to life, in public and in private, and in formal circumstances and and in casual circumstances. The way you show up. Is, is the expression of uh, where you're at. So in reality, there's no time on, time off. It's all important, even though some moments are more important than others, of course. So I'm going to finish now, but if you, if you care and if you're serious and if you, if you care and if you're serious and if you're sincere and if you mean business and you're not playing games, you're not superficial, and you're not lost, other people will recognize it, will recognize your sincerity. Even if they can't meet it and even if they can't meet you there, they'll recognize your depth. And whether they say it or not, your depth will inspire them. Because they'll have met one person who's not struggling anymore in the same way, not ambivalent anymore in the same way. That's a gift. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to try and answer. Yeah, there is one question here, Andrew from Pramod. Um, okay. He is asking. In looking at yourself from the outside in and in the observance of what it looks like, the you looking at you perspective is indeed different from what I've had a chance to observe this far with intention. What is the position taken here? Is it to be an inner guide in terms of observing what needs to happen with the outer construct in this relative journey of becoming? And at what point does this get to being overcritical of one's actions? And can that actually hamper spiritual progress in some way? Or is it the position of learning and adapting in the observing? Would appreciate some light on holding this space while viewing the various facets of one's outwardly expressions. All of the above. <laughs> All of the above. All of the above, absolutely, all. Not just one, it's all of the above. So, so promote, if you're looking from the inside out, you get one perspective. Looking from the outside in, you get another perspective. 
when you're looking from the inside out, you can get various different perspectives. When you look from the outside in, you get various different perspectives. Sometimes the you can be overly critical. Sometimes you can be the opposite. Are you aware of that? If you're being overly critical, and there's kind of some kind of negative judgment going on, are you aware of it? Because if you're aware of it, then you take responsibility for it. It's part, it's part of the observation. It's all of the above. All of the above and more. Thank you, Andrew. Sure. A lot of work to do, huh? <laughs> there are no more questions, Andrew. There's no rest of the weary promote. I'm joking. So you can see that uh, there's so many perspectives that we can take. There's so many perspectives that, that just appear spontaneously. And we need to be able to them and be fair-minded and reasonably objective in relationship to our own cognitive process. And that's not an easy thing to do, to see everything and to be fair-minded in relation to one of his own cognitive processes. And that's why, for example, we seek for enlightened awareness because the awakening to enlightened awareness is what we discover when we transcend the mind. So when we transcend the mind, we discover an infinite depth, an infinite expanse. It's not relative. We realize, oh, this is the ultimate. So then if, you, if, you, if you're grounded in enlightened awareness, that ultimate context becomes the background or the foundation of or the foundation of your conscious awareness and all of these relative perspectives taking happens on top of that up, up, upon this absolute perspective and then there's so many perspectives that appear and they all have relative value some have more some perspectives have more value than others some are very important, some are irrelevant. But you want to be able to see them all and be able to have, be fair-minded and be able to be able to understand and discriminate between what's what's actually has more value than other, what has more value than, than something else. Becoming very sensitive and clear-minded in this delicate process of introspection and contemplation. But what I wanted to say just finally is that um Pramod was that um in relationship to what you're you the question that you asked and to what I'm saying, there is no final perspective. There's no this is this is the the final truth. It's all the truth. And we need to have we need to have a, a big enough a big enough context within us to be able to see it all and be very flexible. Seeing everything as you, as you know when I teach meditation, I say see everything be attached to nothing. So you want to be able to be able to see everything, but be very flexible and not overly identify with any one one truth or one perspective. And most people are not that flexible in their thinking or in their perspective taking. We tend to be rigid and fixed without even knowing it, which leads to unenlightenment. <laughs> so there's no in what we're in what we're speaking about in terms of looks, in terms of the relationship to the human experience. There's no resting place. 
It's just a state of constant vigilance. Constant vigilance, constant vigilance, constant vigilance, and constant vigilance. And in the midst of that constant vigilance, there'll be moments of great clarity, great illumination. And we have to be able to let go of them too. Otherwise they can become a trap also. Seeing everything attached to nothing. The delicate balancing act. That's why, you know, when I teach meditation, my preferred mantra that I share with all of you is paying attention and letting go. Paying attention and letting go. Paying attention and letting go. Now you know why. Beautiful, right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, everyone, thank you very much. I appreciate it.